6. Building Pyramids The agricultural revolution is one of the most controversial events in history. Some partisans proclaim that it set humankind on the road to prosperity and progress. Others insist that it led to perdition. This was the turning point, they say, where sapiens cast off its intimate symbiosis with nature and sprinted towards greed and alienation. Whichever direction the road led, there was no going back. Farming enabled populations to increase so radically and rapidly that no complex agricultural society could ever again sustain itself if it returned to hunting and gathering. Around 10,000 BC, before the transition to agriculture, Earth was home to about 5 to 8 million nomadic foragers. By the first century AD, only 1 to 2 million foragers remained mainly in Australia, America, and Africa, but their numbers were dwarfed by the world's 250 million farmers. The vast majority of farmers lived in permanent settlements. Only a few were nomadic shepherds. Settling down caused most people's turf to shrink dramatically. Ancient hunter-gatherers usually lived in territories covering many dozens and even hundreds of square miles. Home was the entire territory, with its hills, streams, woods, and open sky. Peasants, on the other hand, spent most of their days working a small field or orchard, and their domestic lives centred on a cramped structure of wood, stone, or mud, measuring no more than a few dozen feet, the house. The typical peasant developed a very strong attachment to this structure. This was a far-reaching revolution, whose impact was psychological as much as architectural. Henceforth, attachment to my house and separation from the neighbours became the psychological hallmark of a much more self-centred creature. The new agricultural territories were not only far smaller than those of ancient foragers, but also far more artificial. Aside from the use of fire, hunter-gatherers made few deliberate changes to the lands in which they roamed. Farmers, on the other hand, lived in artificial human islands that they laboriously carved out of the surrounding wilds. They cut down forests, dug canals, cleared fields, built houses, ploughed furrows, and planted fruit trees in tidy rows. The resulting artificial habitat was meant only for humans and their plants and animals, and was often fenced off by walls and hedges. Farmer families did all they could to keep out wayward weeds and wild animals. If such interlopers made their way in, they were driven out. If they persisted, their human antagonists sought ways to exterminate them. Particularly strong defences were erected around the home. From the dawn of agriculture until this very day, billions of humans armed with branches, swatters, shoes and poison sprays have waged relentless war against the diligent ants, furtive roaches, adventurous spiders and misguided beetles that constantly infiltrate the human domicile. For most of history, these man-made enclaves remained very small, surrounded by expanses of untamed nature. The Earth's surface measures about 200 million square miles, of which 60 million is land. As late as A.D. 1400, the vast majority of farmers, along with their plants and animals, clustered together in an area of just 4.25 million square miles, 2% of the planet's surface. Everywhere else was too cold, too hot, too dry, too wet, or otherwise unsuited for cultivation. This minuscule 2% of the Earth's surface constituted the stage on which history unfolded. People found it difficult to leave their artificial islands. They could not abandon their houses, fields, and granaries without grave risk of loss. Furthermore, as time went on, they accumulated more and more things, objects not easily transportable, that tied them down. Ancient farmers might seem to us dirt poor, but a typical family possessed more artifacts than an entire forager tribe. The Coming of the Future While agricultural space shrank, agricultural time expanded. Foragers usually didn't waste much time thinking about next month or next summer. Farmers sailed in their imagination years and decades into the future. Foragers discounted the future because they lived from hand to mouth, 
and could only preserve food or accumulate possessions with difficulty. Of course, they clearly engaged in some advanced planning. The creators of the cave paintings at Chauvet, Lascaux, and Altamira almost certainly intended them to last for generations. Social alliances and political rivalries were long-term affairs. It often took years to repay a favour or to avenge a wrong. Nevertheless, in the subsistence economy of hunting and gathering, there was an obvious limit to such long-term planning. Paradoxically, it saved foragers a lot of anxieties. There was no sense in worrying about things that they could not influence. The agricultural revolution made the future far more important than it had ever been before. Farmers must always keep the future in mind and must work in its service. The agricultural economy was based on a seasonal cycle of production, comprising long months of cultivation followed by short peak periods of harvest. On the night following the end of a plentiful harvest, the peasants might celebrate for all they were worth, but within a week or so they were again up at dawn for a long day in the field. Although there was enough food for today, next week, and even next month, they had to worry about next year and the year after that. Concern about the future was rooted not only in seasonal cycles of production, but also in the fundamental uncertainty of agriculture. Since most villages lived by cultivating a very limited variety of domesticated plants and animals, they were at the mercy of droughts, floods, and pestilence. Peasants were obliged to produce more than they consumed so that they could build up reserves. Without grain in the silo, jars of olive oil in the cellar, cheese in the pantry, and sausages hanging from the rafters, they would starve in bad years. And bad years were bound to come, sooner or later. A peasant living on the assumption that bad years would not come didn't live long. Consequently, from the very advent of agriculture, Worries about the future became major players in the theatre of the human mind. Where farmers depended on rains to water their fields, the onset of the rainy season meant that each morning the farmers gazed towards the horizon, sniffing the wind and straining their eyes. Is that a cloud? Would the rains come on time? Would there be enough? Would violent storms wash the seeds from the fields and batter down seedlings? Meanwhile, in the valleys of the Euphrates, Indus, and Yellow Rivers, other peasants monitored, with no less trepidation, the height of the water. They needed the rivers to rise in order to spread the fertile topsoil washed down from the highlands, and to enable their vast irrigation systems to fill with water. But floods that surged too high, or came at the wrong time, could destroy their fields as much as a drought. Peasants were worried about the future not just because they had more cause for worry, but also because they could do something about it. They could clear another field, dig another irrigation canal, sow more crops. The anxious peasant was as frenetic and hard-working as a harvester ant in the summer, sweating to plant olive trees whose oil would be pressed by his children and grandchildren, putting off until the winter or the following year the eating of the food he craved today. The stress of farming had far-reaching consequences. It was the foundation of large-scale political and social systems. Sadly, the diligent peasants almost never achieved the future economic security they so craved through their hard work in the present. Everywhere, rulers and elites sprang up, living off the peasants' surplus food and leaving them with only a bare subsistence. These forfeited food surpluses fueled politics, wars, art, and philosophy. They built palaces, forts, monuments, and temples. Until the late modern era, more than 90% of humans were peasants who rose each morning to till the land by the sweat of their brows. The extra they produced fed the tiny minority of elites, kings, government officials, soldiers, priests, artists, and thinkers, who fill the history books. History is something that very few people have been doing while everyone else was ploughing fields and carrying water buckets. An Imagined Order The food surpluses produced by peasants, coupled with new transportation technology, eventually enabled more and more people to cram together first into large villages, then into towns, and finally into cities, 
all of them joined together by new kingdoms and commercial networks. Yet, in order to take advantage of these new opportunities, food surpluses and improved transportation were not enough. The mere fact that one can feed a thousand people in the same town or a million people in the same kingdom does not guarantee that they can agree how to divide the land and water, how to settle disputes and conflicts, and how to act in times of drought or war. And, if no agreement can be reached, strife spreads, even if the storehouses are bulging. It was not food shortages that caused most of history's wars and revolutions. The French Revolution was spearheaded by affluent lawyers, not by famished peasants. The Roman Republic reached the height of its power in the first century BC, when treasure fleets from throughout the Mediterranean enriched the Romans beyond their ancestors' wildest dreams. Yet it was at that moment of maximum affluence that the Roman political order collapsed into a series of deadly civil wars. Yugoslavia in 1991 had more than enough resources to feed all its inhabitants, and still disintegrated into a terrible bloodbath. The problem at the root of such calamities is that humans evolved for millions of years in small bands of a few dozen individuals. The handful of millennia separating the agricultural revolution from the appearance of cities, kingdoms, and empires was not enough time to allow an instinct for mass cooperation to evolve. Despite the lack of such biological instincts during the foraging era, hundreds of strangers were able to cooperate thanks to their shared myths. However, this cooperation was loose and limited. Every sapiens band continued to run its life independently and to provide for most of its own needs. An archaic sociologist living 20,000 years ago who had no knowledge of events following the agricultural revolution, might well have concluded that mythology had a fairly limited scope. Stories about ancestral spirits and tribal totems were strong enough to enable five hundred people to trade seashells, celebrate the odd festival, and join forces to wipe out a Neanderthal band, but no more than that. Mythology, the ancient sociologist would have thought, could not possibly enable millions of strangers to cooperate on a daily basis. But that turned out to be wrong. Myths, it transpired, are stronger than anyone could have imagined. When the agricultural revolution opened opportunities for the creation of crowded cities and mighty empires, people invented stories about great gods, motherlands, and joint stock companies to provide the needed social links. While human evolution was crawling at its usual snail's pace, the human imagination was building astounding networks of mass cooperation, unlike any other ever seen on earth. Around 8,500 BC, the largest settlements in the world were villages such as Jericho, which contained a few hundred individuals. By 7,000 BC, the town of Chatelhuic in Anatolia numbered between 5,000 and 10,000 individuals. It may well have been the world's biggest settlement at the time. During the 5th and 4th millennia BC, cities with tens of thousands of inhabitants sprouted in the Fertile Crescent, and each of these held sway over many nearby villages. In 3100 BC, the entire Lower Nile Valley was united into the first Egyptian kingdom. Its pharaohs ruled thousands of square miles and hundreds of thousands of people. Around 2250 BC, Sargon the Great forged the first empire, the Akkadian. It boasted over a million subjects and a standing army of 5,400 soldiers. Between 1000 BC and 500 BC, the first mega-empires appeared in the Middle East, the late Assyrian Empire, the Babylonian Empire, and the Persian Empire. They ruled over many millions of subjects and commanded tens of thousands of soldiers. In 221 BC, the Qin dynasty united China, and shortly afterwards Rome united the Mediterranean basin. Taxes levied on 40 million Qin subjects paid for a standing army of hundreds of thousands of soldiers and a complex bureaucracy that employed more than 100,000 officials. The Roman Empire at its zenith collected taxes from up to 100 million subjects, this revenue financed a standing army of 250,000 to 500,000 soldiers, 
a road network still in use 1,500 years later, and theatres and amphitheatres that host spectacles to this day. Impressive, no doubt, but we mustn't harbour rosy illusions about mass cooperation networks operating in pharaonic Egypt or the Roman Empire. Cooperation sounds very altruistic, but is not always voluntary and seldom egalitarian. Most human cooperation networks have been geared towards oppression and exploitation. The peasants paid for the burgeoning cooperation networks with their precious food surpluses, despairing when the tax collector wiped out an entire year of hard labour with a single stroke of his imperial pen. The famed Roman amphitheatres were often built by slaves so that wealthy and idle Romans could watch other slaves engage in vicious gladiatorial combat. Even prisons and concentration camps are cooperation networks and can function only because thousands of strangers somehow manage to coordinate their actions. All these cooperation networks, from the cities of ancient Mesopotamia to the Qin and Roman empires, were imagined orders. The social norms that sustained them were based neither on ingrained instincts nor on personal acquaintances, but rather on belief in shared myths. How can myths sustain entire empires? We have already discussed one such example, Persia. Now let's examine two of the best-known myths of history. The Code of Hammurabi of approximately 1776 BC, which served as a cooperation manual for hundreds of thousands of ancient Babylonians, and the American Declaration of Independence of 1776 AD, which today still serves as a cooperation manual for hundreds of millions of modern Americans. In 1776 BC, Babylon was the world's biggest city. The Babylonian Empire was probably the world's largest, with more than a million subjects. It ruled most of Mesopotamia, including the bulk of modern Iraq and parts of present-day Syria and Iran. The Babylonian king most famous today was Hammurabi. His fame is due primarily to the text that bears his name, the Code of Hammurabi. This was a collection of laws and judicial decisions whose aim was to present Hammurabi as a role model of a just king, serve as a basis for a more uniform legal system across the Babylonian Empire, and teach future generations what justice is and how a just king acts. Future generations took notice. The intellectual and bureaucratic elite of ancient Mesopotamia canonized the text, and apprentice scribes continued to copy it long after Hammurabi died and his empire lay in ruins. Hammurabi's code is therefore a good source for understanding the ancient Mesopotamians' ideal of social order. The text begins by saying that the gods Anu, Enlil, and Marduk, the leading deities of the Mesopotamian pantheon, appointed Hammurabi to make justice prevail in the land, to abolish the wicked and the evil, to prevent the strong from oppressing the weak. It then lists about three hundred judgments, given in the set formula, if such and such a thing happens, such is the judgment. For example, judgments 196 to 9 and 209 to 14 read, 196. If a superior man should blind the eye of another superior man, they shall blind his eye. 197. If he should break the bone of another superior man, they shall break his bone. 198. If he should blind the eye of a commoner or break the bone of a commoner, he shall weigh and deliver sixty shekels of silver. 199. If he should blind the eye of a slave of a superior man or break the bone of a slave of a superior man, he shall weigh and deliver one half of the slave's value in silver. 209. If a superior man strikes a woman of superior class and thereby causes her to miscarry her fetus, he shall weigh and deliver ten shekels of silver for her fetus. 210. If that woman should die, they shall kill his daughter. 211. If he should cause a woman of commoner class to miscarry her fetus by the beating, he shall weigh and deliver five shekels of silver. 212. If that woman should die, he shall weigh and deliver thirty shekels of silver. 213. 
If he strikes a slave woman of a superior man and thereby causes her to miscarry her fetus, he shall weigh and deliver two shekels of silver. 214. If that slave woman should die, he shall weigh and deliver twenty shekels of silver. After listing his judgments, Hammurabi again declares that these are the just decisions which Hammurabi, the able king, has established and thereby has directed the land along the course of truth and the correct way of life. I am Hammurabi, noble king. I have not been careless or negligent toward humankind, granted to my care by the god Enlil, and with whose shepherding the god Marduk charged me. Hammurabi's code asserts that Babylonian social order is rooted in universal and eternal principles of justice dictated by the gods. The principle of hierarchy is of paramount importance. According to the code, people are divided into two genders and three classes, superior people, commoners, and slaves. Members of each gender and class have different values. The life of a female commoner is worth thirty silver shekels, and that of a slave woman twenty silver shekels, whereas the eye of a male commoner is worth sixty silver shekels. The Code also establishes a strict hierarchy within families, according to which children are not independent persons, but rather the property of their parents. Hence, if one superior man kills the daughter of another superior man, the killer's daughter is executed in punishment. To us it may seem strange that the killer remains unharmed, whereas his innocent daughter is killed, but to Hammurabi and the Babylonians this seemed perfectly just. Hammurabi's code was based on the premise that if the king's subjects all accepted their positions in the hierarchy and acted accordingly, the empire's million inhabitants would be able to cooperate effectively. Their society could then produce enough food for its members, distribute it efficiently, protect itself against its enemies, and expand its territory so as to acquire more wealth and better security. About 3,500 years after Hammurabi's death, the inhabitants of thirteen British colonies in North America felt that the King of England was treating them unjustly. Their representatives gathered in the city of Philadelphia, and on 4 July 1776 the colonies declared that their inhabitants were no longer subjects of the British Crown. Their Declaration of Independence proclaimed universal and eternal principles of justice, which, like those of Hammurabi, were inspired by a divine power. However, the most important principle dictated by the American god was somewhat different from the principle dictated by the gods of Babylon. The American Declaration of Independence asserts that we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Like Hammurabi's code, the American founding document promises that if humans act according to its sacred principles, millions of them would be able to cooperate effectively, living safely and peacefully in a just and prosperous society. Like the Code of Hammurabi, the American Declaration of Independence was not just a document of its time and place. It was accepted by future generations as well. For more than two hundred years, American schoolchildren have been copying and learning it by heart. The two texts present us with an obvious dilemma. Both the Code of Hammurabi and the American Declaration of Independence claim to outline universal and eternal principles of justice, but, according to the Americans, all people are equal, whereas, according to the Babylonians, people are decidedly unequal. The Americans would, of course, say that they are right and that Hammurabi is wrong. Hammurabi naturally would retort that he is right and that the Americans are wrong. In fact, they are both wrong. Hammurabi and the American founding fathers alike imagined a reality governed by universal and immutable principles of justice, such as equality or hierarchy. Yet the only place where such universal principles exist is in the fertile imagination of sapiens and in the myths they invent and tell one another. These principles have no objective validity. 
It is easy for us to accept that the division of people into superiors and commoners is a figment of the imagination. Yet the idea that all humans are equal is also a myth. In what sense do all humans equal one another? Is there any objective reality outside the human imagination in which we are truly equal? Are all humans equal to one another biologically? Let us try to translate the most famous line of the American Declaration of Independence into biological terms. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. According to the science of biology, people were not created. They have evolved and they certainly did not evolve to be equal. The idea of equality is inextricably intertwined with the idea of creation. The Americans got the idea of equality from Christianity, which argues that every person has a divinely created soul, and that all souls are equal before God. However, if we do not believe in the Christian myths about God, creation, and souls, what does it mean that all people are equal? Evolution is based on difference, not on equality. Every person carries a somewhat different genetic code and is exposed from birth to different environmental influences. This leads to the development of different qualities that carry with them different chances of survival. Created equal should therefore be translated into evolved differently. Just as people were never created, neither, according to the science of biology, is there a creator who endows them with anything. There is only a blind evolutionary process, devoid of any purpose, leading to the birth of individuals. Endowed by their creator should be translated simply into born. Equally, there are no such things as rights in biology. There are only organs, abilities, and characteristics. Birds fly not because they have a right to fly, but because they have wings. And it's not true that these organs, abilities, and characteristics are unalienable. Many of them undergo constant mutations and may well be completely lost over time. The ostrich is a bird that lost its ability to fly. So unalienable rights should be translated into mutable characteristics. And what are the characteristics that evolved in humans? Life, certainly. But liberty? There is no such thing in biology. Just like equality, rights, and limited liability companies, liberty is something that people invented and that exists only in their imagination. From a biological viewpoint, it is meaningless to say that humans in democratic societies are free, whereas humans in dictatorships are unfree. And what about happiness? So far, biological research has failed to come up with a clear definition of happiness or a way to measure it objectively. Most biological studies acknowledge only the existence of pleasure, which is more easily defined and measured. So, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness should be translated into life and the pursuit of pleasure. So here is that line from the American Declaration of Independence translated into biological terms. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men evolved differently, that they are born with certain mutable characteristics, and that among these are life and the pursuit of pleasure. Advocates of equality and human rights may be outraged by this line of reasoning. Their response is likely to be, We know that people are not equal biologically, but if we believe that we are all equal in essence, it will enable us to create a stable and prosperous society. I have no argument with that. This is exactly what I mean by imagined order. We believe in a particular order not because it is objectively true, but because believing in it enables us to cooperate effectively and forge a better society. Imagined orders are not evil conspiracies or useless mirages. Rather, they are the only way large numbers of humans can cooperate effectively. Bear in mind, though, that Hammurabi might have defended his principle of hierarchy using the same logic. I know that superiors, commoners, and slaves are not inherently different kinds of people, 
but if we believe that they are, it will enable us to create a stable and prosperous society. True Believers It's likely that more than a few listeners squirmed in their chairs while listening to the preceding paragraphs. Most of us today are educated to react in such a way. It is easy to accept that Hammurabi's code was a myth, but we do not want to hear that human rights are also a myth. If people realize that human rights exist only in the imagination, isn't there a danger that our society will collapse? Voltaire said about God that there is no God, but don't tell that to my servant, lest he murder me at night. Hammurabi would have said the same about his principle of hierarchy, and Thomas Jefferson about human rights. Homo sapiens has no natural rights, just as spiders, hyenas, and chimpanzees have no natural rights. But don't tell that to our servants, lest they murder us at night. Such fears are well justified. A natural order is a stable order. There is no chance that gravity will cease to function tomorrow, even if people stop believing in it. In contrast, an imagined order is always in danger of collapse because it depends upon myths, and myths vanish once people stop believing in them. In order to safeguard an imagined order, continuous and strenuous efforts are imperative. Some of these efforts take the shape of violence and coercion. Armies, police forces, courts, and prisons are ceaselessly at work, forcing people to act in accordance with the imagined order. If an ancient Babylonian blinded his neighbor, some violence was usually necessary in order to enforce the law of an eye for an eye. When, in 1860, a majority of American citizens concluded that African slaves are human beings and must, therefore, enjoy the right of liberty, it took a bloody civil war to make the southern states acquiesce. However, an imagined order cannot be sustained by violence alone. It requires some true believers as well. Prince Talleyrand, who began his chameleon-like career under Louis XVI, later served the revolutionary and Napoleonic regimes, and switched loyalties in time to end his days working for the restored monarchy, summed up decades of governmental experience by saying that you can do many things with bayonets, but it is rather uncomfortable to sit on them. A single priest often does the work of a hundred soldiers far more cheaply and effectively. Moreover, no matter how efficient bayonets are, somebody must wield them. Why should the soldiers, jailers, judges, and police maintain an imagined order in which they do not believe? Of all human collective activities, the one most difficult to organize is violence. To say that a social order is maintained by military force immediately raises the question, what maintains the military order? It is impossible to organize an army solely by coercion. At least some of the commanders and soldiers must truly believe in something, be it God, honor, motherland, manhood, or money. An even more interesting question concerns those standing at the top of the social pyramid. Why should they wish to enforce an imagined order if they themselves don't believe in it? It is quite common to argue that the elite may do so out of cynical greed, Yet a cynic who believes in nothing is unlikely to be greedy. It does not take much to provide the objective biological needs of Homo sapiens. After those needs are met, more money can be spent on building pyramids, taking holidays around the world, financing election campaigns, funding your favorite terrorist organizations, or investing in the stock market and making yet more money, all of which are activities that a true cynic would find utterly meaningless. Diogenes, the Greek philosopher who founded the cynical school, lived in a barrel. When Alexander the Great visited Diogenes as he was relaxing in the sun and asked if there were anything he might do for him, the cynic answered the all-powerful conqueror, Yes, there is something you can do for me. Please move a little to the side. You are blocking the sunlight. This is why cynics don't build empires, and why an imagined order can be maintained only if large segments of the population, and in particular large segments of the elite and the security forces, truly believe in it. Christianity would not have lasted two thousand years if the majority of bishops and priests failed to believe in Christ. American democracy would not have lasted almost 250 years 
if the majority of presidents and congressmen failed to believe in human rights. The modern economic system would not have lasted a single day if the majority of investors and bankers failed to believe in capitalism. The Prison Walls How do you cause people to believe in an imagined order such as Christianity, democracy, or capitalism? First, you never admit that the order is imagined. You always insist that the order sustaining society is an objective reality created by the great gods or by the laws of nature. People are unequal, not because Hammurabi said so, but because Enlil and Marduk decreed it. People are equal, not because Thomas Jefferson said so, but because God created them that way. Free markets are the best economic system, not because Adam Smith said so, but because these are the immutable laws of nature. You also educate people thoroughly. From the moment they are born, you constantly remind them of the principles of the imagined order, which are incorporated into anything and everything. They are incorporated into fairy tales, dramas, paintings, songs, etiquette, political propaganda, architecture, recipes, and fashions. For example, today people believe in equality, so it's fashionable for rich kids to wear jeans, which were originally working-class attire. In the Middle Ages, people believed in class divisions, so no young nobleman would have worn a peasant's smock. Back then, to be addressed as Sir or Madam was a rare privilege reserved for the nobility and often purchased with blood. Today, all polite correspondence, regardless of the recipient, begins with Dear Sir or Madam. The humanities and social sciences devote most of their energies to explaining exactly how the imagined order is woven into the tapestry of life. In the limited space at our disposal, we can only scratch the surface. Three main factors prevent people from realizing that the order organizing their lives exists only in their imagination. A. The imagined order is embedded in the material world. Though the imagined order exists only in our minds, it can be woven into the material reality around us and even set in stone. Most Westerners today believe in individualism. They believe that every human is an individual whose worth does not depend on what other people think of him or her. Each of us has within ourselves a brilliant ray of light that gives value and meaning to our lives. In modern Western schools, Teachers and parents tell children that if their classmates make fun of them, they should ignore it. Only they themselves, not others, know their true worth. In modern architecture, this myth leaps out of the imagination to take shape in stone and mortar. The ideal modern house is divided into many small rooms so that each child can have a private space, hidden from view, providing for maximum autonomy. This private room almost invariably has a door, and in some households it may be accepted practice for the child to close and perhaps lock the door. Even parents may be forbidden to enter without knocking and asking permission. The room is usually decorated as the child sees fit, with rock star posters on the wall and dirty socks on the floor. Somebody growing up in such a space cannot help but imagine himself an individual his true worth emanating from within rather than from without. Medieval noblemen did not believe in individualism. Someone's worth was determined by their place in the social hierarchy and by what other people said about them. Being laughed at was a horrible indignity. Noblemen taught their children to protect their good name whatever the cost. Like modern individualism, the medieval value system left the imagination and was manifested in the stone of medieval castles. The castle rarely contained private rooms for children, or anyone else for that matter. The teenage son of a medieval baron did not have a private room on the castle's second floor, with posters of Richard the Lionheart and King Arthur on the walls and a locked door that his parents were not allowed to open. He slept alongside many other youths in a large hall, he was always on display, and always had to take into account what others saw and said. Someone growing up in such conditions naturally concluded that a man's true worth was determined by his place in the social hierarchy 
and by what other people said of him. b. The imagined order shapes our desires. Most people do not wish to accept that the order governing their lives is imaginary, but in fact every person is born into a pre-existing imagined order, and his or her desires are shaped from birth by its dominant myths. Our personal desires thereby become the imagined order's most important defences. For instance, the most cherished desires of present-day Westerners are shaped by romantic, nationalist, capitalist and humanist myths that have been around for centuries. Friends giving advice often tell each other, follow your heart. But the heart is a double agent that usually takes its instructions from the dominant myths of the day, and the very recommendation to follow your heart was implanted in our minds by a combination of 19th century romantic myths and 20th century consumerist myths. The Coca-Cola company, for example, has marketed Diet Coke around the world under the slogan, Diet Coke, do what feels good. Even what people take to be their most personal desires are usually programmed by the imagined order. Let's consider, for example, the popular desire to take a holiday abroad. There is nothing natural or obvious about this. A chimpanzee alpha male would never think of using his power in order to go on holiday into the territory of a neighboring chimpanzee band. The elite of ancient Egypt spent their fortunes building pyramids and having their corpses mummified, but none of them thought of going shopping in Babylon or taking a skiing holiday in Phoenicia. People today spend a great deal of money on holidays abroad because they are true believers in the myths of romantic consumerism. Romanticism tells us that in order to make the most of our human potential, we must have as many different experiences as we can. We must open ourselves to a wide spectrum of emotions. We must sample various kinds of relationships. We must try different cuisines. We must learn to appreciate different styles of music. One of the best ways to do all that is to break free from our daily routine, leave behind our familiar setting and go travelling in distant lands where we can experience the culture, the smells, the tastes and the norms of other people. We hear again and again the romantic myths about how a new experience opened my eyes and changed my life. Consumerism tells us that in order to be happy we must consume as many products and services as possible. If we feel that something is missing or not quite right, then we probably need to buy a product, a car, new clothes, organic food, or a service, housekeeping, relationship therapy, yoga classes. Every television commercial is another little legend about how consuming some product or service will make life better. Romanticism, which encourages variety, meshes perfectly with consumerism. Their marriage has given birth to the infinite market of experiences on which the modern tourism industry is founded. The tourism industry does not sell flight tickets and hotel bedrooms. It sells experiences. Paris is not a city, nor India a country. They are both experiences, the consumption of which is supposed to widen our horizons, fulfill our human potential, and make us happier. Consequently, when the relationship between a millionaire and his wife is going through a rocky patch, he takes her on an expensive trip to Paris. The trip is not a reflection of some independent desire, but rather of an ardent belief in the myths of romantic consumerism. A wealthy man in ancient Egypt would never have dreamed of solving a relationship crisis by taking his wife on holiday to Babylon. Instead, he might have built for her the sumptuous tomb she had always wanted. Like the elite of ancient Egypt, most people in most cultures dedicate their lives to building pyramids. Only the names, shapes, and sizes of these pyramids change from one culture to the other. They may take the form, for example, of a suburban cottage with a swimming pool and an evergreen lawn, or a gleaming penthouse with an enviable view. Few question the myths that cause us to desire the pyramid in the first place. C. The imagined order is intersubjective. Even if, by some superhuman effort, I succeed in freeing my personal desires from the grip of the imagined order, I am just one person. In order to change the imagined order, I must convince millions of strangers to cooperate with me. 
For the imagined order is not a subjective order existing in my own imagination. It is rather an intersubjective order existing in the shared imagination of thousands and millions of people. In order to understand this, we need to understand the difference between objective, subjective, and intersubjective. An objective phenomenon exists independently of human consciousness and human beliefs. Radioactivity, for example, is not a myth. Radioactive emissions occurred long before people discovered them, and they are dangerous even when people do not believe in them. Marie Curie, one of the discoverers of radioactivity, did not know, during her long years of studying radioactive materials, that they could harm her body. While she did not believe that radioactivity could kill her, she nevertheless died of aplastic anemia, a disease caused by overexposure to radioactive materials. The subjective is something that exists depending on the consciousness and beliefs of a single individual. It disappears or changes if that particular individual changes his or her beliefs. Many a child believes in the existence of an imaginary friend who is invisible and inaudible to the rest of the world. The imaginary friend exists solely in the child's subjective consciousness, and when the child grows up and ceases to believe in it, the imaginary friend fades away. The intersubjective is something that exists within the communication network linking the subjective consciousness of many individuals. If a single individual changes his or her beliefs, or even dies, it is of little importance. However, if most individuals in the network die or change their beliefs, the intersubjective phenomenon will mutate or disappear. Intersubjective phenomena are neither malevolent frauds nor insignificant charades. They exist in a different way from physical phenomena such as radioactivity, but their impact on the world may still be enormous. Many of history's most important drivers are intersubjective. Law, money, gods, nations. Peugeot, for example, is not the imaginary friend of Peugeot's CEO. The company exists in the shared imagination of millions of people. The CEO believes in the company's existence because the board of directors also believes in it, as do the company's lawyers, the secretaries in the nearby office, the tellers in the bank, the brokers on the stock exchange, and car dealers from France to Australia. If the CEO alone were suddenly to stop believing in Persia's existence, he'd quickly land in the nearest mental hospital and someone else would occupy his office. Similarly, the dollar, human rights, and the United States of America exist in the shared imagination of billions, and no single individual can threaten their existence. If I alone were to stop believing in the dollar, in human rights, or in the United States, it wouldn't much matter. These imagined orders are intersubjective, so in order to change them, we must simultaneously change the consciousness of billions of people, which is not easy. A change of such magnitude can be accomplished only with the help of a complex organization, such as a political party, an ideological movement, or a religious cult. However, in order to establish such complex organizations, it's necessary to convince many strangers to cooperate with one another. And this will happen only if these strangers believe in some shared myths. It follows that in order to change an existing imagined order, we must first believe in an alternative imagined order. In order to dismantle Persia, for example, we need to imagine something more powerful, such as the French legal system. In order to dismantle the French legal system, we need to imagine something even more powerful, such as the French state. And if we would like to dismantle that too, we will have to imagine something yet more powerful. There is no way out of the imagined order. When we break down our prison walls and run towards freedom, we are in fact running into the more spacious exercise yard of a bigger prison.